Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. So welcome for joining. Thank you for joining us. We're about to do communion, so grab your elements. Um, also, the worship that we did this morning, you remember that the bride singing Yeshua coming down the aisle, and the, mm -hmm. we did that today. Because I wanted us to remember that Jesus is really excited for us. So I'll attach the link to it later on. Okay. So Jesus, that night before, I've been pondering this. You know, John 14, actually 13 through 17, there's so many beautiful things that Jesus was sharing with his disciples. And it was the night before he went to the cross, knowing what was about to come, knowing... And knowing that Judas was about to betray him. And yet he washed his feet. And he shared such beautiful things with the guy. Knowing what, knowing, knowing what was shortly ahead. Oh my goodness. What extravagant love our beloved had, even for his betrayer. I was just pondering that. And he washed his feet, knowing what he was going to do, washed his feet. It's just, that just really overwhelmed me, actually, when I was thinking about it. So it was that night before. And he, their Seder meal, and he pulled that metal matzah out, which represented the Messiah to come, which was him. And he said, this is me. This is my body that I've broken for you. When you do this, remember me. So my Jesus, we do remember that on your body, you took all sin. And I, can't, I cannot fathom the weight of that. Every sin from Adam at the tree until you come back. Every sin you bore upon your body. And the judgment. And the curse. And the shame. And the guilt. By the stripes you bore. You purchased healing for every sickness, every plague, every pandemic. That even hasn't been invented yet. By those stripes you bore, we were healed 2,000 years ago. On your body, you took all that. You, the law was nailed to the cross, Jesus. Condemnation was nailed to the cross. So Jesus, you did that for us so that we don't have to bear any of that. So we could live free from all of that. And like my Jesus, we remember you and we say thank you. thank God for all the good things he does to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
too late to close my back or income. <laughs> Vehicles to drive. We have a lot of things to be thankful for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the gift of Holy Spirit. Mm. The mind. promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. Isn't that awesome? Same night, he took the cup after the supper. And he said, the cup of the new covenant is my blood. I was reading in John today where he was talking about those who eat his flesh and drink his blood, they will never be hungry and never be thirsty again. And that we will have, it was in John 6, and that we have eternal life if we believe in him. Not eternal damnation, but eternal life. Because of the blood he shed. It was the cup after the supper, a cup of redemption, which also had a wedding slash bridal feel to them at the time because God redeemed them and he gave us a picture of that Boaz redeemed Ruth and Jesus is our redeemer he's our soon coming bridegroom king and he said this is the cup of the new covenant because the old has vanished away but the new has come So Jesus, we remember you and we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that because you shed your blood, we, when we say yes to you, we have that new incorruptible seed placed inside our very being, causing us to be a brand new creature in Christ, something that had never existed before. The old us is gone, but the new has come. And we say thank you, Jesus, that we get to participate in the new covenant because of the blood that you shed. We get to be actual children of the Most High God because of the blood that you shed. And you're not going to drink of this cup again until you drink it with us at the wedding supper, which we're excited for. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, we say thank you, and we remember you. And thank you that because of the blood you shed and the body that you broke for us, we can live free from our past and we can live free from all oppression depression every addiction we can live free we can live free from condemnation and guilt and shame we can live free and we say thank you and I do okay I, I do have one little more comment because I just said. Okay. <laughs> on Monday night when we were here, Harlan said, What'd you say in Bible study last time? He said, Vicki and Vicky and Sharon were sure talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys talked to That's kind of funny. I thought it was kind of funny. That's <laughs> nice. They just like talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to everybody who has joined. <laughs> um, okay. So I have, again, a lot to say, so I have to talk fast, so listen fast. Okay. Um, I also wanted, this really did not particularly have anything to do with this yet, but I just really felt like I, I was impressed to want to talk about it for just a short little bit. Curtis has talked about it in the past. Um, when we talked about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Statements, which are part of the Ten Statement Ketubah, and... Um, uh, And I don't know if you've heard this, Teresa, but um, at the putting Mount Sinai, it was basically a betrothal ceremony between God and the nation of Israel. Okay. It was a betrothal ceremony. And even the Jewish rabbis today look at it and see it as that. Okay. Okay. So the, the, the Ten Commandments that he's given, the Ten Statements, they consider it to be a ketubah. A ketubah is a betrothal contract, okay. a wedding contract. Okay. And when you look at it in that particular light, it kind of changes the flavor of some of the things. So like, there shall be no other gods before me. Like Curtis said the other day um, when he was in Fergus Falls, he was mentioning it. Basically, I don't want you to have any other boyfriends. I want to be the, the only one. Mm -hmm. Throw away all your other boyfriend pictures. <laughs> Basically, okay? Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to talk about in, in that was, um, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Okay? And we have considered that 
to be, hey, Sandy, we miss you. Um, we have considered that to be um, don't do like GD, like that kind of a thing. And that's a very small, minimal part of that, to be honest. Taking the name of the Lord in vain is more like this. Um, when Curtis and I married, I took his name. I was now a coper. I was no longer a Chilcote. I'm a coper. I took his name. If I would go out and do something, write a check for something he would never endorse, mm -hmm. I am taking his name in vain. If I would go out and do something that would totally misrepresent him and who he is, I am taking his name in vain. When we have said yes to Jesus Christ, we are now betrothed to Jesus Christ. And um, there are wedding inferences all throughout the whole Bible, actually. Starts with the wedding, Adam and Eve. Ends with the wedding, Jesus and the bride of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus, um, and, and throughout the whole Old Testament, New Testament, there's wedding references all over the place. Jesus himself, um, much of the, the things that he said, his first miracle was at a wedding. M much of his verbiage actually had a lot to do with wedding talk. For example, when he told him in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, that is actually this, the exact verbiage in that time frame when um, they would have a betrothal ceremony at the bride's home. And if she, if, if she signed her name, well, actually, if she drunk the cup, then that was a yes. If she drank the cup, it was a yes. And in that moment, and then they'd sign names, um, and witnesses would sign. At that moment, they were married in every way, but they weren't going to live in the same house for one to two years because he was going to go build a place for them to live in. Okay. And so they were married in every way. She wore his name. She was betrothed, like Mary and Joseph, okay? Mm -hmm. Betrothed. And when he would leave, when the groom would leave that place, he would say, I go to prepare a place for you. So when Jesus said that to the disciples, they understood that that was wedding conversation, okay? okay. So I'm saying that to say, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. When we have said yes to Jesus Christ, we are now his betrothed. We have his name. We carry his name. We can walk and talk and pray in the name of Jesus because we are his betrothed. But when we misrepresent his name, we are taking his name in vain. When we behave in an unrighteous fashion, we are taking his name in vain. When we speak in an unrighteous fashion, we are taking his name in vain. So taking the Lord's name in vain is much broader than saying GD. How often have we misrepresented our beloved? Taking his name in vain. I just wanted to talk about out and why. I was real impressed that I was supposed to share that little bit. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I know. I know. Um, okay. Um, an offense. We're going to talk about offenses a little bit. An offense, remember we talked about last week, is something that makes you stumble. Remember that? And we remember we talked about Psalm 119, 165. Those who love his law, which is his word, and Jesus is the word, right, will never... Be offended. I'll never stumble. Remember that? Yes. Psalm 119, 165. Good morning. Um, so, we can get to the place where we are not receiving offenses. They may be thrown at us, but we don't have to receive them. We don't have to hold them. Okay? Um, we can get to the place when we are so... In love with Jesus the Word. And we have allowed His love to consume us and to heal our broken pieces of our heart because sometimes our heart has been broken so much it's in tiny little pieces. Right? I remember that Kintsugi picture we showed last week? Oh, yeah. 
Remember that? So how much more valuable is your broken heart going to be when all those tiny little pieces are mended with liquid gold? And how much more beautiful? Right? Right. Okay. So when we can get to the place where we have allowed his love to heal those broken places in our heart, then there's no room, even if offenses are thrown at us, there's no room for them to land. There's no place for the curse to land in you. Right? Satan has come to buffet us, but he's found no, nothing in me. It's not going to be good when we get to that place. Mm -hmm. When he comes at us, but he's, he's finding nothing to attach himself to. Um, so, so it, it is a... We, we need to get to where it is our natural response. And, and, and it, I'm not going to say it's a hard thing, but we have to practice. We have to practice getting to the place when offenses are thrown at us that we choose to not receive it. We put up our shield of faith so they bounce off and can't get in. Okay? Mm -hmm. And... So it's, it's not like a one-time thing. It's, it's a constant thing. Like, it, we just, it, it's like we have to practice it. Because the enemy would like to throw offenses at us all day long. Often through the most loved, treasured ones of our life. Because that's where we're most vulnerable. Right? And so the enemy, remember how we talked also last week, um, when Curtis and I had this season where the enemy was the prince of power of the air, was distorting. I would say something, and by the time it would get from my mouth to Curtis's ears, he would twist it, or, the, or vice versa. He would say something, and the enemy would twist it, and I would hear totally something different than he didn't even say it. So we got to a place where we had to start repeating, this is what I heard, no, I said this. Mm -hmm. So he had to take authority over the prince of power of the air, he did that first, and then we had to start for a season repeating so that we heard what, what was said. Well, to protect yourselves. Right. Yeah, that was really wise. Yeah. So there was a season, several weeks we had to do that. So many times, I'm saying that to say many times, the enemy who wants to drag us down and, and make our lives crazy and, and bring hurt to us, especially from the ones we love the most, he is maybe the prince of power there, and maybe he's doing that same kind of a thing in our lives, and trying to throw offenses at us, trying to make us hear something that they didn't say, or, or hear something in a way that they didn't say it, you know, whatever. But, so he's constantly throwing offenses at us. So we have to practice, practice, practice being at a place where, no, I'm not going to receive the offense. I'm going to put up my shield of faith. And, and, and I'm not, not going to be ugly about it, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to respond negatively, but in an attitude of love, I'm maybe just not going to respond at all, or maybe I'm just going to... And, and we're, we're going to talk about the confronting thing today, too. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to receive the offense. Because probably you didn't mean it anyway. But I'm just not going to receive what the enemy is trying to give me as an offense. I'm not going to receive it. So that's a constant choice. We have to practice that. We have to practice it. Mm -hmm. So it gets to be a natural thing that... <laughs> um, because our journey in life is learning and understanding how to live in the kingdom. How to live in the kingdom of God in our heart. Okay? And it says this, the king. because remember how Jesus said, the kingdom is in you? Remember when Jesus said that? Yeah. Kingdom is in me. So I can choose to live in the kingdom or I can and or I can choose to live by what I see, taste, touch, feel, hear, feel, and see. Mm -hmm. Right? I can choose that. <laughs> so it's my choice what I'm gonna Hello. live in. And so it says in Romans 4:17 what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not oh, eating or drinking, one. but it is one. righteousness, peace. peace. And joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, basically, that I am as I should be. And we talked about it earlier. Given everything that God has done for us. 
when I'm walking in righteousness, I, I can have a happy life. I can walk in love and my love can be fulfilled because he's provided everything that provides to life, life and godliness. He's already given it to me. Every promise is yes and amen for me in Christ, right? right. And so that is walking in righteousness. And um, so if I am understanding and knowing that all of that is mine in Christ because of the cross and the empty tomb, and because I said yes, and the incorruptible seed is inside of me, I can walk in righteousness. I can walk in peace, knowing that I am intimately connected to the creator of the universe. And I can have peace with God because of the cross of Christ. Because of the cross of Christ, he's taken all my crap. And God doesn't look at me with all my crap. He looks at me through the blood of Jesus so I can have peace. And because I'm intimately connected to the God, the creator of the universe, it means I have access to all of his resources. And he is faithful and I can trust him. That's pretty amazing. Yes, it is. And he's not mad at me. Because I have received the gift of the cross of Christ. God put all of his judgment upon his own son. Because he was the sacrifice. And because of knowing that, then I can have joy. It's like I can, I can live in a state where I have like an ongoing party in my heart. That's, that's good. Yeah, right? So oftentimes, we have been blaming God for stuff. Like, why did God let this happen? Why did God, why, you know... You know, people say that, you know, you, you look at these terrible things going on. Well, why does God let that happen? Well, we are blaming God for the con oftentimes for the consequences of our own actions. Or we're blaming God for the consequences of evil and sin in the world. Because, thank you, Adam. Right? And we blame God. Because God is not an Indian giver. He gave authority over the planet to man. Man gave it. Adam, he gave it to Satan, and, and we know that that's true because um, during the 40 days of temptation, um, Lucifer, Lucifer said to Jesus, Satan said to Jesus, oh, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms because they've been given to me. Well, Jesus didn't deny that. He didn't bow down, but he didn't deny that fact. Mm -hmm. However, at the cross and the empty tomb, as a man, Jesus bought, got back all of the authority that Adam lost. Because he's the second Adam. He did it as a man. And then, before he ascended, he said, All authority, heaven and earth, has been given to me. Here, now go. So, he's been given all authority. Paid a costly price for it. Then, when we said yes to him, we carried his name, right? Mm -hmm. Then he goes, here. We are so much more than we think we are. We are so much more than we know that we are. Because we have the same Holy Spirit that conquered everything. That exploded Jesus from the tomb, living inside of us. Same Holy Spirit. We are the betrothed of the King of Kings. <coughs> we carry his name. I can take a check and I can write a check. It has Curtis Coker's name on it, but it has not. That's my name. I can write a check. So we carry the name of Christ. doesn't mean that we can abuse that. We don't want to misrepresent right. that. But we can cast out demons in his name. We can heal the sick in his name. We can raise the dead in his name. We can bring comfort and peace in his name. Right? Right. Instead of choosing to be offended. Right. Um... Once again, okay, so 
Jesus is not an Indian giver. He gave authority of the planet to man. He gave authority to man. He gave man a free will to choose. Adam made a stupid choice at the tree. But we have a free will and we can choose. And we make choices every day, all day long. We choose. And God is, he is not going to come against our personal free will. If we are choosing to allow the enemy to give us lies, that's our choice. If we're choosing to receive that lie, that's our choice. Because he gave us a free will. He, he, he gave us the option to choose. He's not going to override our choice. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if we choose to receive offenses, that's our choice. We can choose to receive them or send them away. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, Sometimes he uses a sense of humor. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I have one in mind. <laughs> <laughs> so um, offenses are something that makes us stumble. The, the thing is, we, we, don't, we have not understood offenses and we have not understood forgiveness. And so we have received offenses and not forgiven. And we've held on to them because we haven't understood. But offenses are something that make us stumble. And so remember this, the children of Israel, they stumbled at the promises of God. He brought them. He brought them to the promised land. Twelve spies went in, twelve spies came out. And, okay, so think of this. Ten spies said, Oh, giants in the land. And we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. And um, how do you take authority over the prince of power of the air? We, we command it in the name of Jesus, number one, because we have authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so they come back. Oh, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And, oh, oh, 40 years later, Joshua and Caleb had said, no, God said he's going to give us this land. They're nothing. We can do this. Let's go ahead and take the land. God said we can do it. And so, of course, they believed the liars. So 40 years later, they had been believing a lie the whole stinking time because the giants and all of the land were afraid of them the whole 40 years. Because, Ray, remember Rahab? She said, we've been afraid of you this whole time because we saw what God did for you here with Sihon. We and all these different kings, we saw how God delivered you. We saw what God had did. So we've been afraid of you and in terror of you this whole time. So for 40 years, they believed a stupid lie. They didn't even ask. They didn't even say to these people they went in the land, didn't even say, well, what do you think about us? You know, what are you, what are you thinking? You know, what are your thoughts? They just said, oh, they were giants. And we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And no. Oh. So they chose fear. They chose fear. They believe the lie the whole stinking time. How many times have we done the same thing? We believed the lie that the enemy gave us. Forty years they believed a stupid lie. So, they stumbled at the promises. Were they saved at the end of the forty years then? Well, at the end of the forty years they went and took the land. Joshua took them in. By this time, that time was kids. Yeah. yeah, it was the kids. But I mean, he provi God provided for them the whole time that they were wandering in the wilderness and in the provision land. You know, Curtis likes to say manna was the provision of God. He, yeah. They were supposed to be in the promised land, but they were living in provision land. They had water from the rock. He did miracles for them and all that the whole 40 years. But they were supposed to be being in the promised land. Well, it wasn't part of that because they had a slave mentality. They had a slave mentality. They didn't have a son yeah. mentality. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, yep. But sometimes we are the same. Mm -hmm. Especially when we have been living under legalism and law. We feel like we are slaves and servants and we have not understood. We are children. We are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. He's our father, and he's a good, good father. And he has nothing but good in mind for us. He 
has given us the name of Jesus. <coughs> and all we have to do is walk in who we are. <coughs> so, we have been feeling unworthy and unqualified of the promises, so we have stumbled. We have been offended and haven't received those promises because we feel unqualified, we feel unworthy, we feel um, we're not good enough. We've made this mistake. In my past, I did this and this and this, so I'm, I'm not worthy for these promises of God. But yet, we're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. New has come. And so, the offense in our heart has limited our ability to trust God and to receive his promises. Um, so if we don't believe it, and we don't understand it, we don't understand how to operate in the authority, that is actually ours. So again, what you choose to allow, God can do nothing to help you there, because you've allowed it, and he's not going to violate your free will. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Romans 9, 32 and 33 says this. Why? Talking about the children of Israel. Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, which was Jesus. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. But whoever believes on him, Jesus, will not be put to shame. The Amplified says that this way. And why not? Because it was not by faith that they pursued it, but as though it were by works, relying on the merit of their works instead of their faith. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, which is Jesus Christ, as is written, and forever remains written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him, Jesus, whoever adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, will not be disappointed in his expectations. Isn't that kind of powerful right there? Mm -hmm. We won't be disappointed. Um, the New Living Translation says that last line like this. Whoever trusts in him will never be disgraced. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. So Jesus was the rock of offense for them. And what he accomplished for us on the cross, <coughs> that the promises are ours because of Christ, not because of the works I have done. And they stumbled over that. Because they didn't do it. They stumbled because of unbelief. And in that word for unbelief, it means that they were unpersuadable. Even though they had Joshua and Caleb come out and say, Yeah, we can do it. Look what God has already done. And he had already done amazing things. I mean, he wiped out all of Pharaoh's chariots in the Red Sea. They saw him... They saw God wipe out Pharaoh's army. I mean, they had seen big miracles already. And Joshua and Caleb came back with those 12 and said, Oh, no, don't listen to that lie. We can do it. God is on our side. We can do it. Didn't they have fruit? Didn't they have fruit? Yeah. 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 It's like big fruit. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, were they like big fruit? Fruit. They brought back Yeah, they, fruit they were bringing back from fruit the from the land. That wasn't even. And so, they, but they still chose to believe the lie. Because they had the slave mentality. That they weren't good enough, they didn't qualify. Mm. But yet, the promises of God are freely ours in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this. For all of the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Amplify. For as many are the promises of God in Christ, they are all, all answered yes. So through him we say our amen to the glory of God. New Living Translation says it's a resounding yes. So in this, there is many promises to the whole thing. And it says here, all of the promises of God in him are yes. 
and in him, amen. There's a lot of promises in here. Yes, in the Old Testament, it is hard to read sometimes how the children of Israel have done what they did. A whoring after other gods all the time. But there are promises after promises after. Deuteronomy 28 has some beautiful, precious, priceless promises. There's many promises in here. Psalms has many, many promises. And every promise. Are you in Christ? Yes. Raise your hand if you're in Christ out there. Your hand. So if you're in Christ, every promise in here is yes and amen to you. Every one. All of them. They're all yes and amen. Thank you. Promises of peace and health and prosperity and rest. Provision. Yes and amen. Um, yep, 2 Corinthians one twenty. So we need to have an understanding of the biblical concept of forgiveness. And basically it means to send it away. When an offense comes, see, we have to understand all this other stuff. So that our heart can be filled with this. Our heart can be filled with who we are in Christ. Our heart can be filled with the love of God that passes all understanding. The love of God that will never quit, never fail us, never end. Never end and never fail. So that our heart can be filled with that. So that when an offense comes, whether it's real or perceived or... First of all, there's no room for it to land. But when it comes, we can choose to send it away. Just send it away. In our heart, just send it away. And that's what forgiveness means. I'm sending it away. I am not going to hold it. I'm not going to receive it. I'm not going to wear it. I'm sending it away. Does not, again, we said this last week, does not make the action um, right. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't say that what that the action or the words were right. But I'm not holding it. I'm not going to wear it. But can you have a conversation Yes, we're going to. Yes, we are going to talk about that. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> you did this. <laughs> but when we have that conversation, let's have it in love. Okay, so we'll get to there, that in a little bit. Um, so, once again, we have choices every day. All the time. We can choose to send it away or we can choose to keep it. Okay? And if I choose to keep it all the time, I am making myself unpersuadable. And then I, I become like a magnet for offenses. You know what I'm saying? It, have you ever known people, and it seems like um, bad things happen to them all the time. It's because they have kind of believed it and they've had an atmosphere about themselves, and so they, it's like a magnet that draws those things to them. Oh my gosh. It's like a magnet. Could somebody write that? Yeah. 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 So they, they, because they've made that choice all the time to receive it, so it's like a magnet. Um, we can choose things that are destroying my life or choose things that are blessing my life. If we, but the thing is this if we don't choose, blessing by default I've chosen curse if I don't choose peace by default I've chosen chaos and destruction if I don't choose to forgive by default I'm choosing to live in offense so we have to choose peace we have to choose blessing we have to choose peace we have to choose joy and say it verbally sometimes Sometimes, maybe at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So then, because if we don't make that choice by default, we're choosing the opposite. Mm -hmm. And Satan needs to know where we stand. Mm -hmm. Like, so, nope. So we you're a liar. Get, nope. Right. So we can't I'm get sending that away. Mm -hmm. no. I'm sending that away. Peace and joy. And oftentimes, like um, you, you've heard these stories, you know. Um, in the past, like someone who's had a, a real thing in their heart because of something that happened, when they finally forgive that person for that thing, they experience a healing in their body. Because unforgiveness, offenses, 
cause stress and strain and anxiety in our body and, and will bring sickness upon us. If we live with offenses, we're going to bring sickness to our body. That's why, that's why forgiveness is not so much for them as it is for me. Right? Because if I can forgive and loose myself from that, I'm loosing myself from the anxiety and the stress that comes with the offense and the unforgiveness. So what were the three things you said? Peace, blessing, and joy? Yep. Peace, blessing, joy, forgiveness. What's the opposite? Um, if we don't choose blessing, we've by default allowed the curse to come. Peace. If we don't choose peace, by default we have chosen confusion and chaos and destruction. If we don't choose forgiveness, by default we're choosing offense. Mm -hmm. And choosing again, we can choose to prevent the pain from coming or later cure. So if we haven't, it's better to choose prevention. That's what this is. It's better to choose prevention than to allow the offense to come and then have to choose the cure. Because once the sickness comes, it's harder to get out of that. Mm -hmm. okay. Forgive quick. Forgive quick. Yes. <laughs> yes. Forgive quick. Because once the pain starts, it's hard to get healed. Prevention is much easier than curing the problem. Okay. And we're going to go into chapter 17 a little bit. Overcoming the need to judge. Because a lot of times we have made a habit of accepting judgment. We can accept criticism, but never, 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 never accept judgment. Um, and if we are making that choice to not walk the path of judgment, whether us judging others or receiving judgment from others, okay? It's kind of a two-way thing. If we're, if we're choosing to walk a path of not judging mm -hmm. and not receiving judgment, it's actually, it's a whole new way of living. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new style for us. It's a whole emotional, new emotional navigation system. Because I am not choosing to judge others, but I'm also not choosing to receive their judgment on me. And sometimes... Um, if we have been living in a life of judgment, like like if, if we think if, if we've all, it, it, it's a principle. The way we feel like God is with us, that's how we are with others. So if someone who's always very judgmental about other people, they feel like God is judging them all the time. And they never measure up. And so nobody ever will measure up either. And, and you have to do this judgment. It's kind of a self-protection thing. Well, then they're worse than me, right? It, it becomes like that. But if you are choosing to walk <coughs> in a life, I'm going to choose to not judge. I can be a fruit inspector for sure. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can watch um, their, I, I, can, I, I can watch the fruit. I can see the fruit. But I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge that I understand why they're doing what they're doing because I don't know their heart. Am I better than God? No. Only God knows hearts. So if I'm going to choose that path, I'm not going to judge, but I'm also going to choose the path, I'm not going to receive a, a judgment from others. But sometimes if I'm a judgmental person, I think they're judging me when they're not because I'm judgmental. So I think, oh, I see. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, if I live a life of judgmentalism, I think they're judging me too. And they may not be. And that might be where paranoia comes from. Uh, do. <laughs> no. Yeah. That can open up a, a world of mental illness. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a whole new um, way of living if we're choosing to abandon judgment and actually walk in love. Oh, okay. Because never we never need to assume that we know why somebody did what they did. Because we don't really know their heart. We don't. But we think we do sometimes. We think we're so whatever. 
The wisdom is to only deal with the facts, what we is observable, or maybe what they've chosen to tell us. And they, you know, when we have created that atmosphere of love and safety, then sometimes people will be willing to. I oftentimes find some people telling me things like, "Okay, <laughs> they." I, I sometimes people feel safe, and so people will tell me things. Mm -hmm. And so, when they choose to tell you things about their heart, then you can know that. But if they don't tell you things, all you have is observable facts. Okay. When we make assumptions, that leads us into trouble. Because you know how assume is. Yeah. You make an ass of you and me. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that, Joy? I did. That's how it's spelled. A S S U M E. I think at the nursing home the first time. Yes. So we make assumptions and, and we, you know, like we assume that they know, that we know what, why they did what they did, so we make assumptions. Yeah. And that gets both of us in trouble. The word says, yes, we can observe the fruit, but it doesn't say to judge and assume the why of the fruit. We can watch the fruit. We can see the fruit. Like, for in, instance, in child training, um, we have often asked, well, why did you do that? But instinctively, that has taught the child, if I can have a good enough excuse, then it's okay, I did what I did. Even when they knew it was wrong. You know, I'm sure I did that too. But um, instead, we should say, what did you do? And what should you have done? Mm -hmm. Instead good. of why? Yeah. What did you do? What should you have done? Because instinctively, Chris has talk, talked about this, instinctively, we have a conscience. And our conscience knows what is righteous and unrighteous. However, when we have lived with repeated sinful actions, that kind of dulls our conscience. So, the point is, we can change. We can change. And we can live free from judgment. We can live free from judgment of myself. Because we judge ourselves. And we can live free from the judgment of others. We can't change others, but we can change ourselves. Okay? And um, when there are others who have had actions that we have perceived to be rude, okay, we can do like Matthew 18, 15. NIV says this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. New Living Translation says this. If another believer sins against you, go privately. Point out the offense. If the other person listens and confess, then you have won that person back. So this is the thing. When, you are, um, when someone has done something that we have perceived as rude, first of all, check your own heart before you make the confrontation. And in, in that moment, release all the judgment, release all the why that you think that you know they did, why they did what they did. So release all of that. Because if we're casting a judgment, judgment seeks a penalty. Okay? But the goal should be to restore a relationship. Okay? The goal is not to point a finger. That's not that's not the that's not the goal to point a finger. No. No. <laughs> no. No. And it should be done in love. Okay? Um, I want to read page ninety nine. Yep. If we cannot confront in love, then we are not ready to confront. We can ask ourselves some questions before we confront in order to check our motives. Am I doing this just to prove that I'm right? Or am I simply trying to get in the last word? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> am I just trying to win the argument? Am I just trying to get even? 
Well, the way I'm doing this promote peace or conflict? Will the way I am planning to handle this negatively affect the person's self-worth? By asking ourselves these questions, we can get a firm grip on our personal responsibilities. The fact that a person has offended us does not relieve us of our own personal responsibilities. So, it's, it would be like this. First of all, let's just say um, there was a conversation between me and my husband, me and Curtis. First of all, I'd say, I love you, honey. Let's start off that way. And, you know, when you said this, this is what I heard, this is what I received. And then he said, well, I didn't mean that. And then, you know, hugs and kisses. Or, and then I could say, well, maybe if you could have said it not with this tone of voice, or, you know, not like this, you know, or maybe you could use other words, you know. Mm-hmm. But all, but, like, I, I love the way he said it. Am I trying to get in the last word? Am I trying to prove myself right? Am I, you know? Mm-hmm. Or am I wanting to maintain and confirm and, and build a better relationship between us? Mm-hmm. And humility. And humility. Yeah. And humility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Love and humility. Mm-hmm. And kindness. Mm-hmm. Just... It's all wrapped up in love, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And again, um, it does not mean that we are a doormat. Jesus was not a doormat. He was humble. And he was not judgmental, but he was not a doormat. Okay? So, but when when we make that confrontation, it's without judgment, but in love. There's times when I felt like a doormat. Mm-hmm. We're not meant to be a doormat. Right. He never wants us you to be a doormat. Feels too. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. we all do. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're not meant to be a doormat. So, <coughs> informing of the effect <coughs> of the action and how it made us feel, but not an assessment of the character. Oh, please repeat that for me. <laughs> we can inform of the effect of the action we can inform how it made us feel but not give an assessment of somebody's character because okay. <laughs> because because the assessment of the character were pointing fingers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so when i said to somebody you're not acting like a christian <laughs> Doesn't oh, <laughs> oh, oh my. I have. Right to my husband's face. <laughs> <clears throat> so again, the goal should be to help them as well as ourselves and give them an opportunity for them to be helped and to do something about it. You know, maybe when you did this particular thing, it appeared like this. But maybe if you did it a different way. When this this action appears like this. I think my weak, my greatest weakness is because I'm, I don't know which personality type I am in the book, but I'm a peace person. And it takes several confrontations before I finally explode. And you <sighs> instead because I wasn't being heard mm-hmm. the first five times, mm-hmm. I finally say, You're not yeah. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> and yeah. that's when I heard him. Yeah. Gee, I'm getting too honest here. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But no, but but, but we can all learn. And and so then Maybe some sometimes maybe it's not in that moment. Maybe in another later, like the first or second time, instead of waiting. Yeah. You know, in the first, if he didn't hear you at that moment, maybe later on when there, yeah, when there's when there's a moment, say hey, a little bit earlier, and when when you did this, it it seemed like this, you know. 
Sometimes. And and I know sometimes it's maybe because you didn't hear, you know. Yeah. Well, literally, my husband has a hearing problem, yeah. so. Yeah. But otherwise, I do think that he doesn't hear me. Right. And, and so maybe, maybe in a later time when he's maybe not busy with work stuff. Yeah. In, in another time. That's key, you're right. In another Get time. Get him in the right box. Mm-hmm. Because when he's in work stuff and he has 12 things on his mind and 12 things going on, and it's, it's hard for him to hear. Yeah. And so because he has 12 things going on, it's just, you know, he's, he's trying to address things quick. Mm -hmm. And maybe not in, the, in a very lovely way. So maybe later, when he doesn't have 12 things going on in his brain, later, when there's a moment, hey, you know, back here. And, and first of all, I love you, you know. <laughs> Kiss them up real good. Yep. Then yep. talk. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Because um, they may not know how their actions have affected you. So when, con when after confronting in love, if the same action continues, don't, don't judge. Don't assume that you know why. Um, they might be dealing with some of their own personal issues. I think work has a lot to do with it. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Harlan, I could never have talked to him when he was working. He was like, you're arguing. You're arguing. He'd walk away from me. He was so frustrated. Yeah. But I think a lot of it was, you know, working and stress at work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should never have to work in our lives. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, Again, we can't assume that we know why people are doing what they're doing, saying what they're saying, how they're saying it. They very might, they may, they may very well have a huge broken heart themselves that needs a lot of love and mending from Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's why when we make these confronting things, do it in love. Not in judgment, but in love. Um, Thanks for talking that out. It was mm -hmm. very helpful. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Yay. So when we give up our right to judge, we free ourselves and we free the world that's around us. Um, chapter 18 talks about being free from justification. Like um, when I make my own excuses for why I am the way I am. Well, I am this way because... Well, you don't know how hard things have been for me, you know, making my own justification. So the only thing that freedom will take away from me is all my excuses. From early on, we have lived and learned to live a reactionary life, and we've given up control. And what I mean by that is, from early on, we have reacted to how our parents have been with us. We have reacted to how our brothers and sisters have played or not played or been mean or nice to us. We have reacted to how the school kids were. We have reacted how the we have reacted to how everybody's actions have been towards us. So we have lived a life of reaction, which means that we've given up control. We have we have allowed outside circumstances to control my behavior because I've reacted to it. But that's, and we, we didn't know any better. And so therefore, we have given up the lordship of our life to others, not to Jesus. Because we've lived the life of reaction. Instead of responding to his love. 1 John 4, 8 says this. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The message says that this way. The person who refuses to love does not know the first thing about God because God's love. Amplified says this. The one who does not love has not become acquainted with God does not and never did know him. For God is love. He is the originator of love and it is an enduring attribute of his nature. That word for know. The one who does not love does not know God is the word gnosko, which is um, intimate, personal experience that produces fruit basically it's the greek word that is the same word as yada in the old testament and it, that yada is when adam knew eve they had a son 
So that word for gnosko means an intimate, personal um, relationship that has that you've experienced, and it will bear fruit. So that's what that word no means. Gnosko. Mm -hmm. So basically, they might be a saved person, but they've not been experiencing Father's love. Okay? So it doesn't mean they're not saved, but they have not been experiencing his love, which means they can't give it. You can't give what you don't have. So if you have experienced his love and let his love heal your broken heart, then you're going to be free from judgment of yourself and of others. And if you are living in God's love, it frees you to stay in control. Then you no longer have to live a reactionary life to what everybody else does. You can stay in control and submit that control to Jesus. 1 John 4.18 says this in the Living Bible. We need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we're afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. The New King James says this. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Because see, judgment, we judge because we fear. We judge because we fear. And the Amplified says this, There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love and has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. The message says this in verse 17 and 18. It's First John 4. God is love, and when we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God, and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear since fear is crippling. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. <coughs> is that powerful? Yes, it flipped up. That was the message. The message. Mm -hmm. So that was 1 John 4, 17. And this last one was 17. 8, 4, 1 John 4, 18. But in message, it was 17 and 18. Okay. So. Fear not in love. Mm -hmm. So we can, if we allow his love, if we begin to know his love, that gnosko, that experiential knowing that bears fruit, his love. We can, in every situation, respond to God's love and freedom and not react to people's actions. So, once again, back to the choices, that's a choice that we make, moment by moment, really. Responding in every situation, no matter what the situation is, we can respond to God's love and freedom rather than people's actions. Sometimes when someone blames you for something or says, you know, and, that, and you didn't do it, it's like, I'm not even going to comment on it. What do you do? Yeah, sometimes... What do you do in that situation? Is it right just to... That's what they want to think? Think it, whatever they do. Sometimes, and, and that, that, would, that would be, maybe ask Holy Spirit what to do at that moment. What's right in that moment? I was faced with that about a week and a half ago. And I wasn't even there to defend myself. And, and it was just a couple things at work where... Um, See, work. Just a couple things that at work that push, totally push were work. lies a, about how I was operating in in the job mm -hmm. that was throwing um, people off and not being on the same page as everybody, and it was a total lie. 
Two lies. Was it stem from the other person being jealous of you? Well, it what, what it was. We have we have someone that gets so many cigarettes a day, and that's it. And we sign for it, and that's what I was doing. That's what I was doing. And then, then it was said that oh, I just go to the carton and get as many as she wants all through the day, and don't even worry about just giving her the. And it's like and that wasn't true. Where did that come from? I'm signing. I'm going. I'm signing for it, you know, not lying about it, you know. And then another thing was, this was funny. One of the guys was saying that I told him that it wasn't necessary for him to ever have his vitals taken, ever. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm his crutch. <laughs> okay. So that was a lie too, you know, so... But then what was so sweet, and Adrian made so many points with me here too. He went to the nurse, because she was the one kind of upset about it. And he said, you know, those aren't true. Those are not true. So he stood up for me and was like, oh, he, he, needed, he needed some points. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Was it, I, have to ask I can send you links. I wonder new gal that started or something. Or that, I, you know, that would say lies. It, it went all the way through everybody, even right down to the handyman. It just went like a gossip through the place, hmm. and it was like. Was it employees? Crazy, yeah, employees, employees. Employees that said it. Yes, yes, and Research. yeah, it's crazy. The new young ones that start in our snow boy, they just want the comfortable for the older ones. It's like, some, oh, some like I got a lot of trouble, and I'm like, I didn't even say that or do that. I'm like, so happened to me all the time. Yeah. Wow. If, if we can respond to situations, mm -hmm. no matter what they are, mm -hmm. in God's love and freedom, rather than react to people's actions, mm -hmm. then we are releasing ourselves from having to justify ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, that peace came. Mm -hmm. That peace came after Adrian said what he said. Mm -hmm. It's like that peace came like I don't have to try to battle this anymore. It just went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's great. So we need to pay attention to Holy Spirit. And so once again, we have to, Jude, he says, build yourself up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to spend time in that so that we are familiar with Holy Spirit's voice. Because mm -hmm. the enemy comes with stuff. <clears throat> and so we need, we need, we need discernment. We need to understand, you know, this is how Holy Spirit talks, and this is a lie over here. Mm -hmm. Because we've, we've talked about this before. Holy Spirit is never going to come at any of us. <clears throat> he convicts us of righteousness. He mm -hmm. will say, mm -hmm. Joy, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This action didn't quite match up. We'll do better mm -hmm. next time. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's never going to come with the downer and like, you're stupid and, you know, you're no good. That's not him. He's going to come and convict you of righteousness. And, and this action doesn't fit, but we'll do better next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's not going to come with the downer. Right. Thank you, Jesus. No, that's not him. So we need to be familiar with Holy Spirit, know their fruit. And so, like, in, in those moments, do we respond? Do we make a confrontation? Or we just be silent about it? Ask Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 19.3 says this. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at the Lord. So Because sometimes we get involved in something that we shouldn't get involved in. And we take on, um, this is um, another thing that we sometimes do. If we're feeling um, a lack in our life or if we're feeling that we're kind of no good, we sometimes get involved in somebody else's trouble because if I get involved in their trouble, it makes me feel better. Right? Well, I've always used that philosophy all my life because it does make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I understand, but then we have to act, ask and see. listen to Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Don't just necessarily jump into somebody's drama. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit about it. Because sometimes if we're always jumping in, if we're always jumping into our kids' drama and rescuing them, then they haven't learned the consequences. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I was thinking, you know, like when, when a girlfriend is having some problems, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. maybe it strengthens me to not be mm -hmm. thinking about my own problems. Well, it, and that's when it's, it, that's when we need to ask Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just ask Holy Spirit. Because he knows if they're ready. Um, but sometimes we, we jump into things and then we uh, then we cause trouble. Or there, and we don't cause trouble, but there is trouble. 
um, amplified in Proverbs 19, 3 says this. The foolishness of man undermines his way, ruining whatever he undertakes. And then his heart is resentful and rages against the Lord for being a fool. He blames the Lord instead of himself. Where is that? Proverbs 19, 3. the Lord I take it more inward yeah so we need to remember we are free from our past we are free from the law and we are free to respond to life situations in God's love and God's wisdom we are free to say no we're also free to share his love we are free to forgive I thought this was a powerful statement. Unconditional love is the only debt that we incurred from the cross. Everything else was paid in full. And this is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. We kind of all know what it says, like in the New King James. I'm going to read that in the Amplified. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. And it's not jealous. It's not envious. Love does not brag. And it's not proud or arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but it rejoices with truth when right and truth prevail. One Love. 106. I highlighted it. Yep. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each one, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. It endures all things without weakening. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements or inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. That was good. Yeah. Once again, walking in love does not mean that we are being a doormat. Jesus always walked in love. But he was never a doormat. He was never taken advantage of. He was never manipulated. And he was never controlled. And he didn't always do what everybody asked either. Also, treating others in love has nothing to do with who we think they are, but who we are. In Jesus because we need to know who we are in Christ and we need to accept God's Word and Jesus as our standard not what the world says I love you too um, Chapter 19 talks about being freedom, being free from self-judgment. And that's another thing that we often do. We judge ourselves. We put ourselves down. Um, and when we do things like that, if I am judging myself or anybody else, I think I'm smarter than God, apparently. That's a powerful statement. Yep. It is. <clears throat> it is. Um, self judgment is the worst. Our own self talk. Like um, you've heard Curtis talk about um, when he was when Christopher was eight and they were working together and Curtis did something and and um, it was not a, a great thing he did. He goes, "Oh, you're stupid!" And Christopher said, "Dad, you're not stupid." So oftentimes, because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, a lot of times we'll say things. Like, oh, I'm such a stupid idiot. Or, oh, uh, you know, how many times have we done things like that and called ourselves names? And when we do that, remember last week we talked about information and events 
with great emotion is how things are written on our heart. And the greater the emotion with an information or event, the deeper it gets written on our heart. Mm -hmm. So when we do something and we go, oh, you stupid, and we're calling ourselves stupid, we are writing that on our heart. And we need to not, we need to not do that. We need to, that means we need to understand who we are in Christ. And Christ lives in me. And is Christ stupid? No, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not. <clears throat> That's a um, powerful one, great emotion. Yes. I think from Ireland's PTSD never showed emotion. That was really, really hard for me because like, I sit around someone else that showed emotion. I was thinking, wow, what are they looking at? Yeah. Was, that was a hard one. That was really a hard one. Yeah. It was. But it was. Because he never, my dad died and I thought, wow, because him and dad got along. He didn't show any emotion. I mean, that was really strange, you know, but I just thought that and never said anything. So, <laughs> yeah, years. Mm. Well, he had great emotion about some things that were written on his heart in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Things that he saw. Yeah. And he still sees. Mm -hmm. So it is important. So if we are doing things like that, like, you know, we do something, we go, oh, you're stupid. We are writing self-condemnation all, all over our heart, <coughs> condemning our own self. So we need to not do that. Which means, like, you, you miss this. Christ lives in me, right? Mm hmm is Christ stupid? No. So when I say that, you know, well, Christ lives in me. And he's not stupid. Because as we are, as he is, so, so are, are we. we in this world. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is such a good reading. Paul even said uh, things about not judging ourselves. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 5, New King James says this. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will continue from God. And I have this in um, multiple translations, and it's really awesome. The Living Bible says this, What about me? Have I been a good servant? Well, I don't worry or overthink. What you think about this or what anyone else thinks, I don't even trust my own judgment at this point. My conscience is clear. But even if that isn't final proof, it is the Lord himself who must examine me and decide. So be careful not to jump to conclusions before the Lord returns as to whether someone is a good servant or not. When the Lord comes, he will turn on the light so that everyone can see exactly what each one of us is really like deep down in our hearts. Then everyone will know why we have been doing the Lord's work. At that time, God will give to each one whatever praise is coming to him. So, this is the thing. Since we, and Paul admitted, he really didn't even know the depths of his own heart. That's what he was saying. I'm not even going to judge myself. Because really, who knows the depths of my heart? God the Father. God the Father. God the Father. He knows my heart. I don't even know my heart. So, if I don't even know my own heart, how do I think I know what somebody else is thinking? Right? All right. So, we need to be fulfilled in God's love, responding to that living free from the law. We need to respond to God's love and live free from the law and condemnation. Be free from having to earn God's love. We don't have to worry about judgment from us or others. So, basically, we need to accept God's view of ourselves. So, in that... I'm passing out some things that I've passed out in the past. And I'll attach them later for y'all. So here, take one and pass it. Take one and pass it. I don't know how many I have. Oh, wait. Oh, that's the old one. Wait, wait, wait. I have two. No, no, no. This is the old one. That's the old one. Okay. Here, this. That. Yeah, pass it back. Okay. This, take one and pass it. Um, one had two of these. Yep. Yeah. No, you, I, I, I was giving you the wrong things. Oh, that one's an old one, too. So take this one and pass it. Um, oh, that looks really good. Yes, these are all really good. Ooh. Here's another one. Take one and pass it. Ooh, John's going to love this. I'm going to have to hand 
So I will attach these later online so you can print them for yourselves. And um, so these are all things about knowing who you are in Christ. And so when you see them, print them for yourself. And read them every day until you, until you own it. Well, and actually read them out loud so you hear it. Yes, yes. Because your heart is going to receive more when your heart hears your own voice. Mm -hmm. That is a powerful truth. So, simply, simply accept God's view of you. Thank you. Yes. And chapter 20, we're going to um, go over that just a little bit. Knowing my stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I don't need to carry somebody else's pain because I have enough of my own. Oftentimes we want to, we talked about this a little bit earlier, we want to move into somebody else's stuff because I don't want to deal with my own stuff. So I'm, we're crossing boundaries. And once again, ask Holy Spirit. Ask Holy Spirit. And just respond to Holy Spirit and respond to love. And like for um, we talked about before, sometimes we as parents want to um, rescue our kids, even rescue our adult kids. But then that limits them from learning from the consequences if we continue to rescue them you know and once again that is ask holy spirit ask holy spirit because it might be a moment they need the rescuing and they will respond well to that but so ask holy spirit that we just really have to be very much in tune with holy spirit um and number one number one don't look for love in all the wrong places don't look for acceptance in all the wrong places will bring us home. Yes. We need to find our love and find our acceptance in Christ alone. And then and allow his love to come in and heal the broken places of our heart. So that we have love and we can respond in love no matter what the action is. We can respond in love and we can confront with love. And confront the actions, not the personal character. We can we can confront about the actions. And if we are full of love, we have an atmosphere that is um, feels safe that other people will know that they can share with you things, and then you can help them. Any thoughts, any questions? This has been very good. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Adrian. It was last weekend. And we just kind of had a, a discussion about past failures with one another. Things that were have been just a long time things that have been brought up before but it was so crazy how and I know we're not supposed to keep a list of wrongs you know but I have known that I have forgiven him for things so when I would bring things up because he'd bring something up I'd, I'd bring things up there was no pain there was no pain with what I was bringing up it would be I'd bring it up and it'd go fizz, fizzle bring something else it would just fizzle out there was no pain. I was feeling no. I mean, so it's like, well, I have forgiven him. All that pain is gone. So why am I bringing anything up? And we, I think we both just learned a whole big bunch in that conversation, as stressful as it was. I, I especially learned that I am healed of the hurt of the past with Praise the husband. Lord. Praise the Lord. And I, you know what I felt like? I felt like the tables were turned, and I was the bully. I did feel that way, and it did not feel good for me to bring anything up at all about his past. So I know God has changed my heart, and it's like, okay, 
I really learned something this weekend. And hmm. this is just not going to happen because I know for a fact God has healed my heart. I don't have to struggle anymore. Praise the Lord. And I'm not going to bring anything up. Because God had me real um, go back to the times when I verbally spoke, I forgive you. He reminded me of those things. And it's just like, okay. Okay, then let, we can go on. You know, it's, it was good. It was uncomfortable, but it was really good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That Sweet. is true. I've had Sweet. that happen. That is something I'm not going to ever talk about. Right. But I, I okay. between yeah. us, but it's mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. pain of the past. Just yeah. On him, on him that I, I always say I forgive, and then things come up, and, and then it was, you know, and I think really it goes back. You know, the other day I had a thought, and it has to go back to when God thinks you should only have one hurt not two. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's how I felt, you know, when I first got married, some of the, any, you know. It, mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So who wants to pray us out? <coughs> I will. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this. Thank you for the friends we have in Christ the love that you bestow on us each and every moment the things we say things we do we hope that you continue with that love Lord we need it and we love you Lord thank you so much for this session today and the sessions in the future and the sessions in the past I pray that we learn from them and use them in our life with other people and other people see Jesus in us. Amen, amen. 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 Thank you for joining. Next week, chapters 21 through 24. I was thinking my prayer to my Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.